All right, you may have your seats. You may have your seats. Well, good morning, family. Good morning. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Jerry Wilson. Everybody calls me Jay Will. And I have the privilege of being the planting pastor of this young church. City of Refuge, we're a simple church seeking to call all to Jesus and to connect to his greater family and to live commissioned as kingdom citizens. Uh, I was so thankful for the prayers this morning. Justin had said, now we're going to pray if Jay Will was speaking tongues. I'm not. You don't have to worry about that. I won't be speaking in other languages, but I'm so glad as a church we can authentically pray in multiple languages because that is the day we're looking ahead to. The kingdom of God where all nations and all tribes and all tongues will confess of our good Savior. And as we look ahead to that day, we are reminded by his word that we have an authentic faith that we can have our confidence in. And today, our sermon is called Confidence in a Counterfeit World. Um, Growing up in my neighborhood in the early 2000s, and I'm learning how old I actually am because when I give illustrations now, people look at me strange. So I hope this lands well. But growing up, um, I was a sneakerhead. I love sneakers in my high school. You were judged on the sneakers you wore. If you had the newest J's, if you had the newest Air Force Ones, you were judged. Now, most people couldn't afford the new shoes. So we all knew of this man called the Shoe Man. On every corner across from a gas station, there would be a car set up with the trunk open, and there would be just this elaborate amount of shoes all over the place. And you would see some of the most exclusive looking J's and Air Force Ones. And from a distance, that's would be like, yo, that right there, I haven't seen those yet. And they will always have like the best price tag, like $50 for one pair. You get two pair for $75. You can get three pair for $120. It was always like the best prices you could ever imagine. You walk up and then you start noticing, hold on, Air Force One fused with J's? <laughs> and he'd be like, oh man, that's exclusive. And that's exclusive. Like, this, this right here is a special order. These are coming out next year. And you'd be like, well, how did you get them? Man, I got a cousin that work at the factory. It's always a cousin that work at the factory or something. And he's like, yeah, they, they haven't even put these on the market yet. I got them ahead of time. You can get them before anybody else has them. And in my youthful zeal of wanting to be, uh, to stand out from the crowd and to be better than those I went to school with, I purchased quite a few pair. And so did quite a few others. We flocked to purchase these shoes, but then realized sooner or later they were starting to look a little iffy. Jordan's legs were spread open into a split. The, 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 the Nike swoosh looked more like a C or a question mark at times. As you can see, these were counterfeits. These were fake. But it was hard to tell the real from the fake from a distance. You had to be close up on it. It had some authenticating markers to it. These these authenticating markers, you would actually have to take time to examine it. But the man would talk so fast that you wouldn't have time. He's like, man, I got to get to these other customers. You want to get these at $50? Look, I'm getting you a deal because I'm about to charge them $75. He's talking fast, so you're either going to buy or not. So you didn't have time to examine this counterfeit if it was authentic or not. Uh, We have a counterfeit problem in our world, especially in our society. Matter of fact, CBS News put out that counterfeit, we have a $2 trillion worth of counterfeit being sold a year. I want you to catch that. Not million, $2 trillion worth of counterfeits being sold a year. Counterfeits are a big problem in our society. And it's a costly, uh, uh, a costly problem. It's costly in our capitalistic society, society. But there's a place where counterfeits are even more costly. It's costly in the church. You see, we also wrestle with many counterfeits in the body of Christ. There is many other gospels in the body of Christ that's saying this is the true authentic authentic gospel. Maybe you've heard of a few of these. There's the good person gospel. If you just be a good enough person, then God will accept you into the kingdom of God. That's a lie. Jesus said no man is right. No, not one. No one is good. So don't take it up. I'm not saying you're a bad person. Jesus is. Take it up with him. 
There's the expressive individualistic gospel, which means this is just me and Jesus. It's our personal little relationship. It doesn't matter about those around us. But Jesus is coming back to make different people a new people. He's coming to make a nation, a new kingdom. So it's not about you and Jesus and your little individual relationship. It's about the corporate relationship that he's creating in the new people. There's the optional Jesus, meaning Jesus is a way to God, but he's not the way. Well, that contradicts what Jesus said himself. He said, I'm the truth, the light, and the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. But there's a gospel that says, well, yeah, I heard what Jesus said, but... What about all the other people that say God's name? There's the prosperity gospel. Jesus died so we can all drive Benz, y'all. Don't y'all know that? (laughs) Jesus didn't die for our riches, but he does offer the riches of his grace. And in our text, we're going to face another gospel that we all wrestle with. It's the faith and gospel, meaning yeah, you got to believe Jesus and also do this, and that's how you're really safe. Which you'll see in our text, it's not the truth. And, and it should ask, make you ask this question, what counterfeit gospels do you possibly believe? What are some counterfeit gospels you possibly turn your attention to and, and a tag on to your Christianity? Paul's argument today is, answering the question, what is the authentic gospel we can have confidence in? To help you keep up where we've been, in chapter 1, we covered how we're saints in Christ, so we should, know him, should make him known in all seasons of life because he gives us confidence for life and death. In chapter 2, Paul tells the church to practice love and humility after the likeness of Christ because he, in his godliness, emptied himself on our behalf, therefore do likewise. And then he sent, then Paul sends two examples, Timothy and Aphrodite, for as a faithful representative of a Christ-centered life. And today in our text, if you were to remember one thing, this is what we're focusing on. Paul is reminding the church to joyfully put their confidence in Christ to experience an authentic faith. Our full confidence is not on Anything else but Christ and Christ alone. This is what Paul is getting to. And he gets to it in a very interesting way. In verses 1 through 3, as he talks about this true confidence, he says, in addition, in the Hebrew, I mean, the Greek is actually, it says, finally. It sounds like Paul is finishing up the letter. But we have a whole other chapter after this. So what is Paul doing? Well, he's showing this transition. He says, and another thing, in addition One more thing, brothers and sisters, and here's the melodic line. The melodic line means this reoccurring line that he's carrying us through this book. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Remember, rejoice has been that thread that has continued to pull us through. Rejoice where? In the Lord. Rejoice where? In the Lord. So it's, it's, almost, it's almost like the, the hook of this book is rejoice, rejoice, joy. Be glad in the Lord. So why would he say, and another thing, my brother says, rejoice in the Lord. He's setting up the argument. He says, to write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. He says, I want to let you know how you can rejoice in the Lord, but also I'm always going to boast about the same thing. I'm always going to continue to talk about the same thing because I hope the same thing I'm talking about is going to keep you. It's safeguard. So what is he trying to keep him from? Verse 2 is where we get into the meeting, meat and potatoes of this text. It says, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Uh, hermeneutics principle, anytime something said twice, it's important. Anytime something says three times, Pin it. That is the main thing. That is a big deal. Him saying, watch out, watch out, watch out, means he really wants you to be on guard. And who are they watching out for? For these dogs, for evil workers, for those who mutilate the flesh. Paul is actually making a play on words here. He's using a word that sounds similar in Greek to circumcision. 
So watch out sounds similar to circumcision. And then he says dogs. Well, why is he using dogs as an illustration? Because if a Jew called you a dog, they called you a Gentile. Right now, he's turning that on his head and said, actually, it's Jewish people I'm telling you to watch out. They're the dogs. They're the savage beast. They're the workers of evil. They're the evil workers who are manipulating, making problems. And they are the mutilators of the flesh, cutting themselves up. Paul, at this moment, is making an argument against, actually, the Judaizers. The Judaizers are those who are going around and saying, you can only be a Christian if you're also circumcised. This was actually a big problem in Acts 15. When Paul was at the church of Antioch, some, church, some, some believers from Jerusalem came to Antioch and saw all these Gentile believers and said, oh man, we see you, but y'all don't really know Jesus because y'all haven't circumcised yourself yet. And it created this big dispute in Acts 15 where they said, well, what does it mean to actually follow Jesus? It says, to put your faith in Christ and those who are not born of Hebrew lineage... They should just focus on Christ, make sure they're not eating meat that's offered to sacrifices. Why? Because they don't want to offend their Gentile brothers and sisters. And they're keeping themselves pure from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is a primary doctrine of the church. Hear that. Sexual immorality is a primary, sexual immorality is a primary doctrine of the church. He said, this is what it means to follow Christ. Make sure you're offering your body to God, your whole body, and make sure you're not offending your brother and sisters. So if the main doctrine is offering your body to God, then why would Paul tell him, watch out for the circumcisers, the ones that say, cut yourself up to make yourself holy before God? Well, because the way they were offering circumcision in this moment was the same way pagans would worship pagan gods. This is actually part of the law. They were breaking the law, as Paul says in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 5. It says, priests may not make bald spots on their heads, shave the edges of their beards, or make gashes on their bodies. So here's to help you understand what's taking place in the law. What pagans would do, what idol worshipers would do, was say, if I want to find favor with God, i got to offer them a little sacrifice. So I, I, I'll just, if I shave some of my hair and offer it as a sacrifice, God will bless me. The, 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 the pagan, the idol gods will bless me and we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have a fruitful year. If I just cut my flesh a little bit and, and offer a little bit of my blood, then God will be happy and pleased. If I, if I cut all my hair off my head and make myself bald as an offering to the gods, then the gods will shine down on top of my bald head and reflect life back up. But Paul was actually saying about these Jews who were so focused on the circumcision, is y'all are treating God as just another idol. You're thinking the way to get blessings from God is to offer him a little part, and he'll bless you. I want to give you a a, a litmus test that may help you notice if you've been influenced by a counterfeit God. Do you think if I just do one more thing, God will be pleased with me? If I just read the Bible one more time, God will be happy with me. If I just go into the right career path, God will finally be happy with If I just go to the school that God, you, you, we even pray that way sometimes. God, just, just show me how to make you happy. God is not like one of these idols that we just offer him a little something and he blesses us. But the difference between the idols of the Bible that we make with our own imaginations and our own hands and the God of the Bible is God wants all of us. He wants every part of us. He doesn't want us to, quote unquote, do these little things to make, to please him. He says, no, no, I'm calling all of you. I want a full relationship with you. I'm not a passing God that's going to bless you. I'm not like someone you just put a couple dollars on the nightstand and say, have a nice night. Yes, that's how we treat him. God 
is the God who wants all of us. So it's not our jobs that influence God's pleasure towards us. It's not the schools we go to. It's not the policies or politicians we vote on. It's not the amount of prayer or fasting. These aren't the things that please God. If you can fill in the blank with anything, I want to let you know you've probably fallen victim to a counterfeit gospel. Paul says, here's the reality. Here's where the true confidence is. He says in verse 3, for we are the circumcision. The ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. He's saying the only ones who can know they have the real faith, they have true confidence, are the ones who've been washed in his Spirit, who is now owned by him. We've been sealed. We've been made known to him by him. We've been brought to him in Christ Jesus. That's the only ones that can have true confidence. He actually says this again, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 through 14. He says, in him you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the words of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believe. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possessions to the praise of his glory. So God saved us through him. He saved us by him. He he put a down payment on us by his spirit, and now he keeps us. All this is not about trying to figure out how to please him. It's just figuring out how to enjoy him, to be in him, to to hold on to him. Paul is saying, they're telling these, beware. If anybody says you can't enjoy the Lord unless you do more, then they don't know the Lord we have to enjoy. The Lord says, you can enjoy me by knowing me, by knowing what I've done for you. You can just enjoy and say, the Lord has got me. That means when when I don't enjoy him, the Lord still has me. (laughs) And he will bring me back to joy. So now I can rejoice in him because it's him. It ain't me. This is the counter, this is the truth, the confidence we can have despite the counterfeits we often think of. What are some counterfeit ideals? that hold you back from enjoying the Lord? What are the things you're thinking, I got to do more, I got to do better? See, to understand a counterfeit, you must look at an example of a counterfeit. You must know the, you must have confidence in the truth, but you must look at an example of a counterfeit. And this is actually what Paul does. He says, if you want to know somebody who should be able to boast, just look at my own life. Verse 4 through 7. This is where counterfeits get their confidence. He says, although I have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day. That means even on the Sabbath, he was born and he made sure he was born on the right day so that on the Sabbath, he he didn't make his parents work to circumcise. He waited the eighth day. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Why is it so important that he says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin? Benjamin was the last born son of the wife Jacob loved, Rebekah. Through through Benjamin was the first king Saul was of that tribe. In 2 Chronicles, Benjamin was the only tribe that aligned with Judah and remained faithful to the, the dynasty of King David. He said, my name, my family lineage... We've been about this life. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Regarding the law, Pharisee, I hold the law perfectly. I know the law backwards, forwards. I could quote it to you off the top of the head. Paul was that guy. Regarding zeal, I was willing to kill the whole church, persecute the church. Regarding righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Here's a guy who's saying, man, I... Made sure I didn't break the law. I worked so vigorously at making sure I didn't break the law. That if you want to weigh me against the law, never broke it. Which means he probably broke the law about pride, but that's another thing. He said, I never broke the law. But everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Paul said, if you knew my family... If you know my history, if you know my background, if anybody wanted to boast, 
I should be the first in line. I could boast. My name carries weight in society because of my family. My, 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 my prestige went before me. When I showed up, they were like, oh, there goes Saul. That's my boy right there. That's a good guy right there. When I walk in the room, people know me. And Paul was puffed off, off of life. He said, if anybody wanted to say their name was the greatest, I could say it. But then Paul was humbled. Acts chapter 8, Paul was, Acts chapter 9, Paul was humbled. While he was all puffed up, he met a name that was greater than his name. A name that carried more weight than his name. He was brought to the ground and he says, and when the Lord says, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? Here I am going to please the Lord, but all of a sudden the Lord coming to me and saying, no, you're going the wrong direction. Who are you, Lord? That's when he experienced Jesus. Paul understood that despite all that his name carried, all the prestige that was behind him, it meant nothing before Christ. It meant nothing before Christ. Paul knew what it meant to have zeal to try to prove yourself before God, but also have an empty life before God. I wonder if we can be honest how many of us may have zeal to try to prove ourselves before God, but really be empty before him. What do you boast in? Paul is like, I could boast in the flesh, but it doesn't mean anything. What, what do you try to boast in? Do you boast in your Christian upbringing? I, my parents were Christians. My, my household were Christians. They made me memorize the whole Bible before I was seven years old. Are these things you try to boast in? Maybe it's in some Christian experience. I remember one time I was walking in the woods and the Lord like opened up heaven and it spoke to me. And it was, he spoke to me and said, here I am. Like, do you, is that something to boast in? Maybe it's none of those things. Maybe you didn't grow up as Christian. I didn't grow up as a Christian. Maybe it was just I'm, just, I'm I'm just being a good person. I've always been a good person. I've always been a positive person. I've always been a person people can rely on and trust. And that's where my goodness comes from. Paul says in, in all of these things, it's a loss. It means nothing. It is empty. Family, I want you to know if you boast in anything but Christ, if you boast in anything and have your confidence in any other place, it'll never be good enough. It'll never be holy enough. This is why Paul writes to the church of Rome. He says, I can testify about them that they had zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God. In an attempt to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's for righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What Paul was saying is, just like these, these Jews had zeal, I had that same kind of zeal. Just like these Jews thought they could boast themselves up and make themselves righteous before God, I did the same thing, and it meant nothing. Because at the end of the day, Christ is the only hope we have. Family, do you think Christ is the only hope you have? Are you still trying to hit the mark of perfection? Let me just tell you, that mark, boy, it's a small mark and it's hard to hit. It was only one that actually hit it. And he wasn't of this world. It was only one who hit the mark of perfection. That's why Paul says, I, I did all the things. I did all the things to look good before everybody. Everybody knew my name. I could puff myself up and it meant nothing. That's why before Christ is a loss. He had a counterfeit confidence. How do we have this true confidence that we started off talking about? Because all of us, in some ways, wrestle with this counterfeit confidence. But well, Paul ends off in 8 and 9 with a faith-filled confidence. He says, more than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, it don't matter how good I am, how much I know, what I've done, none of that means anything compared to the weight of glory of who God is. Who Jesus is. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung. I want to take a moment here. That word dung there is one of the fun words of the Bible. He's explicitly saying animal manure. 
I want you to fill in the blank what you think that is. That's only good to be thrown in the dirt and hope it might produce something. He says, everything that I've done, everything I've held up high as what makes me worthy is nothing before God. It's like dung. But once I realize it's like dung, that's when I realize where my gain comes from. So I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but, f- the, but one that is through the faith in Christ and righteousness from God based on faith. Paul said, a mouthful that says, everything I did meant nothing and everything he did meant everything. <laughs> in in, in J. Will's translation, I ain't did enough, but he did it all. And family, that is where faith is found. That's how we can have confidence because we have to put our faith in the only one who puts the work in, put all the work before us. Martin Luther once said, faith is living, is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. Meaning, if we have this kind of faith, if we have this kind of confidence in the one who has done all the work, even if we die, we know we rise. Even if it feels like this world tells us we fail, we know we succeed. Even when the weight stacks up against us, we know it's going to be lifted. That is the kind of faith we could put in God's grace, his undeserved grace, his undisputed grace, his unlosing grace, his unmerited grace. What do I mean by unmerited? Meaning we didn't do anything for it, but yet he gave it. Paul is saying, I did all these things and man, they meant nothing. But then Christ did one thing, one powerful, magnificent thing. What did he do? Oh, the the Savior of the world saw us in our inability to continue to walk with this counterfeit weight of glory. So he came to give us real glory by bringing his glorious self to this unglorious world and dying a glorious death that we're like, why? For you. On the cross, the the creator of the universe was spit on by the creation. Clothes ripped off of him. He, He cried aloud, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He understood the weight of being forsaken, but he did this so that we would never be forsaken. He breathed his last breath so that he could breathe that breath into us, giving us his righteousness. So now all the counterfeit hope we've been putting on ourselves, if I just do enough, we can shed it off and say, wait, but my God did enough. My God is faithful. My God is righteous. My God is holy. So as I strive and I stumble, I know my God lifts me up. And because of this, I can live in this weight. I can live under the weight of this life. I can live in this counterfeit world that tells you you need to do more. You know what's funny about this world? There's a lot of judgment on the church saying, hey, the church is supposed to do this. And some of it is true. Let me say that. The the world is saying a lot of truth. The church is supposed to be loving. But we're not loving so that we can be the church. We're loving because we've been loved by a God who has created the church. So we are loving through him. Oh, the the church is supposed to serve the community. There we are. But we don't serve the community so we can can know the Savior more. We serve the community because we were once served. And we're following in the likeness of our server, the one that served us. This world continues to tell the church more and more of what we should look like. And it's always from afar, just like that shoe salesman. Those shoes look real good from afar. But as you get close and you start to examine it, You start to examine the truth of God's word. You start to realize how far we are always going to be from the glory, but how close we're always getting to the glory. And we'll never get there on our own, which is why we needed someone to bring us there, someone to make us holy. That is where our confidence is found, not in what this world tells us we're supposed to be, not in what speaking heads on YouTube tell us we're supposed to do, not in these things, but in the Savior that we could put our faith in. And he gives us confidence to live. 
That's why we can sing like we sung earlier, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name and Christ alone. Cornerstone, faith made whole. This is why we can trust in him, because he's the only one who will build us up. Everything else tears us down. Everything else is setting up to humiliate us. That's why when he was humiliated on the cross and he went in the grave, yeah, the world thought they won. <laughs> All of hell partied that day. The Savior's dead. Salvation has lost. But three days later, when rolling the grave, gravestone away, he walked out triumphantly with life in his hands. And he says, now in me is all authority. All who trust in me is the fullness of life. And now those who trust in him has been washed by his blood. And we can walk confidently in this fake world. We don't have to put on a facade. I want to let you know, you don't have to be strong enough. I think this is the beauty of the Christian walk. Yeah, we should be growing in our strength, but we should be relying on his. We don't have to be good enough. Yeah, we should be growing in the good works that we do, but we rely on his good work, and he is building us up for good works. You don't have to do more. But if you enjoy him, you long to do more. Because we rejoice in him. Oh, Savior, oh, 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 saints, oh, sinners who wrestle, oh, saints who wonder. We have a good Savior who is wrapping us in his arms and bringing us close. And yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but he's already done all the work. And now we can just have confidence. God is doing something in you and me. So when you stumble and fall, you don't have to cover in shame like Adam and Eve. You can say, here I am, Lord, help. And he will help you, build you up. He will wrap you with community to hold you accountable. He will bring those around you to practice presence with you so that you can be present. He can be present with you as your, as your peers in the body of Christ are present with you. And he will carry us through to the end. So just like those shoes, man, those shoes, I, I, I threw all those shoes away a long time ago. If the bottom didn't fall out. <clears throat> We need to throw away all the counterfeits in our life and put our confidence in the one who makes us authentic, who makes us whole. The bottom would never fall out in his life, and he will be the ground that we can stand on. Oh, Christian, will you stand in him today? Will you trust in him today? Will you put your hope in him today and be filled with faith today? Will you pray with me? Lord, I stand here as a, as a struggling Christian often who wrestles with if I can put my confidence in you. I am so thankful that we can look to you and you will make our hope whole. You would carry us through to the end. I'm so thankful that it's not in our merit, but it's in your grace. It's in your mercy. And Lord, I pray today that your believers, your saints would leave this place encouraged knowing that you are the one that's carrying them through, that you are the one who will see them to the end, and that we would leave this place transformed by that power, knowing that the Savior is enough. So when the lies of this world tell us we're not doing enough, we can remind the world that our Savior has done enough, and we can trust in him, and we can rejoice in him, and we can have hope and faith in him. And as we have hope and faith in you, Lord, that you would empower us to do more. For you have called us to do greater works. You have called us to go to the ends of the earth. That is an impossible task, but yet you are the God of impossibilities. So use your people for the impossible as we know that you are the one who makes all this possible. You are the one we have all confidence in. You are the one who is building us up, and you are the one who will see us through the end. So Lord, empower us now as we continue to sing as we continue to worship you and help us to worship you in spirit and truth with full confidence that you hear us and you receive it. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to sing with us?